Whoa! Verge, what's the matter, buddy? <laughs> so you got him excited. <laughs> Me too, Verge. Me too. <laughs> Do you have a series that you love? Has it ever released something that just baffled you beyond belief? XCOM is that series for me. I love XCOM 2. War of the Chosen, oh, mwah. It's amazing. Gorgeous game. Not without flaws, but extremely fun. Then, its sequel arrived. A little game called XCOM Chimera Squad. It's awful. It's disgusting, and almost entirely filled to the brim with flaws. From talking to friends about it, it seems like a lot of XCOM fans don't even know this game exists. The ones who do seem to be mixed on it. I myself used to be one of these people who didn't really know much about the game. I ended up looking into it after a series of XCOM 2 streams I did on this channel. I was replaying it for the third or fourth time in my life here. Vanilla, of course, for the pure experience. The last one with the robot, with the drone, <laughs> was a, called a specialist. I had some fun with the audience, named some soldiers after him, immediately got him murdered. A 14? A fucking 14? Fun was had by all. R.I.P. to those who died. <laughs> after the finale, though, I was feeling great, and I thought to myself, man, I want to play more XCOM. And you know, I got this Chimera Squad game on sale for a couple of bucks recently. I've never played it, I've never really looked into it, maybe I should just boot it up here on stream, see how it compares to XCOM 2. Suffice to say, uh... <laughs> I don't know about that animation. Ugh. Ugh. I hate it. The game is broken, abilities simply don't function half of the time, it's ugly, the characters don't make any sense, the world doesn't make any sense, and it's trying to deliver meaningful commentary while sabotaging its own message. Which, of course, is why I played it two times in a row from start to finish, because I am a crazy person. I am a crazy man shouting outside of your gas station about aliens and snake women, and you have no idea what I'm talking about, but it's entertaining and you might give me half of a sandwich by the time I'm done ranting. Hold that thought though, and that sandwich, I'll have it later, thank you. Returning viewers will know that in my last video I partnered with Gamersups. So many of you used my code with Gamersups that we were able to afford an overabundance of treats for Dograck. Frankly, too many treats. She is at risk of becoming an orb. If you don't stop using code Varrock, soon we're gonna be rolling her down the stairs and bouncing her off the wall and maybe dunking her into a hoop once in a while for fun. For those of you who don't know, Gamersups is primarily known for their gamer powder, which makes your brain go fast. I actually drink it every day, and I highly recommend it. They're also known for their anime titty merchandise on cups, shirts, and many other things, which also makes my brain go fast, just in a different way. They also sell food now. They sell gamer soup, which, let me just say, I predicted without knowing about it in my last video. Go check. What did I call gamer soups? I called them gamer soups. I was being real fucking cute. Thanks, Thanks gamer, gamer soup. <laughs> <laughs> Jay Schlatt, Shy Lily, you got my business email, I'll take my royalties anytime! All that is to say, go to gamersups.gg and use code VEROC or click the link down below and you can get 10% off your entire order. All proceeds go directly into Dograck's belly. At some point, the proceeds will probably have to go into buying Dograck a treadmill, but we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. All that is to say, genuinely, thank you all for your support, it's been amazing. Now back to the video! <laughs> The gameplay is borderline experimental, some might say. Barely functional, me might say. They're obviously trying some new mechanics. Here they are on screen. I don't care to talk about it all day because it's not as interesting to me as the world that they tried to create for this game. To really comprehend it though, you need to understand the story leading up to it. So, whether you haven't played before or if it's just been a while, here's your XCOM lore refresher. 
Aliens, they're real! Not only are they real, but they invaded Earth in 2015, and no thanks to you, they conquered us. Good job, idiot. 20 years later, you used guerrilla warfare to try and beat them back, and you succeeded! Good job, idiot! Five more years, and aliens live among us! But like, not secretly, they just live next door. And in my bed. There are three main arguments I've heard in defense of this game from Chimera Squad apologists. <laughs> and I'm gonna address them and get them out of the way right off the bat. Number one. Why do you care, bro? Because I like getting fixated on things. I don't have to pretend to not care about anything like you. <laughs> Number two. Main title XCOM games are $60, and this is only $20, so obviously it's gonna be less polished. Sure. Here's a bunch of games on the screen right now. They're all incredibly good video games and $20 or less. A relatively lower price point is not an excuse to be bad shit-ass video game not worth playing that doesn't make any sense. So I don't want to hear it, young lady. Go to your room! Number three. But it's just just a spin-off. Chimera Squad is a spin-off, but it's not just a spin-off. Because you know what else it is? Canon! The devs confirmed that this game is how the story officially continues in the XCOM universe after XCOM 2. So sure, it's a spin-off, but it being canon to me? means in terms of writing and world building, it can get judged by the same standards as everybody else. This video is about a game's story. A story of humans and aliens living together, where the writers did not understand the aliens of this game's world, and did not understand humans in real life. Five years after the war ends, after all these, these oopsies, these uh-ohs, these tiny little war crimes against all of humanity, you got Chimera Squad. The game is set in City 31. Aliens and humans living and working together, a model of peace. Now, unlike the writers of this game, I assume that my audience has an IQ high enough that they could, like, open a window or, you know, hold a pencil and write with it. So I'm assuming most of you listening to this right now are thinking, okay, we retook Earth, and the aliens who were being mind-controlled into killing and enslaving us aren't mind-controlled anymore, so... What happened after that? What happened during those five years in between? Did humanity forgive them? Could we forgive them? Did we reinstate order, make new countries, rebuild the earth, reenact our justice system, or did we just slaughter them all in a riot? Has it been total chaos for five years? This premise sure could get complicated really quickly if it doesn't elaborate on what happened to that gap of time. It sure could, viewer. It sure could. Well, it's a funny explanation, you see. So, what happened in the time in between the two games was a failed attempt at cashing in on the mobile gacha game market. It was called XCOM Legends. A cut above the rest! Less more ED! Oh, you meant story-wise. Oh, um... Uh... We don't know. Chimera Squad never explores that in detail. This will be the source of many problems very soon. Anyway, you control a special forces unit made up of both aliens and humans. The Chimera Squad. Meant to help keep the peace in City 31. They all have very little in the way of personality. Part of this is because the humans don't act like humans, and the aliens didn't know they were voice acting aliens. Kill me now. You all heard him say it. I'll do it. But they're a crack team. They're skilled. They're efficient. They're some of the ugliest motherfuckers I've ever seen in my life. Except for Tork. She's okay. Mwah. You keep the peace by taking out larger threats to the city that the local police can't handle. These threats take the form of three main rebel groups, which are all assisted by a secretive fourth rebel group who are sort of masterminding the whole operation. Their first act is to attempt to assassinate Mayor Nightingale, but fortunately 
apparently Chimera Squad is there to have really unnatural dialogue between a woman who was orphaned twice during the war and an ex-Advent officer who might have been responsible for it. Birch? <sighs> what took you so long? Had to unpack a breaching charge. Good man. Not exactly. You know what I mean. I always do. So creepy. Don't ever change. Don't ever change. Don't ever change. Uh, I mean, Chimera Squad is there to make me throw up in my mouth a little bit. Uh, sorry, I mean, Chimera Squad is there to save the day. They rescue Mayor Nightingale and get her out of there. Except she blows up 10 seconds later because Chimera Squad fails at most things. The game loop after the tutorial is that you pick an insurgency group to target and you go on missions after them until you take out their leader. You repeat this until all three of them are dealt with and then you can take on the mastermind group as the final boss. <laughs> Chimera Squad's gameplay is mediocre at best. Some might even say that it sucks. So if the gameplay is lacking, that means that the story and the world building is the only thing left to try to immerse or engage the player. Which is why, when the game completely fails to explain very, very important things that would be relevant for the story of this game, and it completely clashes with the tone of the previous game and what we know of the previous game, and what we know of just maybe humans in general, it's a little confusing. I'm going to tell you some of the choice assumptions that this game makes. While I do, please prepare yourself for the Chimera Squad apologists to begin coping very hard. One of these copes may include something to the effect of, but Bedak, uh, it, it actually is explained if you go read the book. No, media can and should be able to explain itself. If you have read the books of the Lord of the Rings series and you go to watch the movies, your experience may have been enhanced by reading the books, but it is not necessary to read the books to enjoy those movies as the masterpieces that they are. You can watch all three movies in a row and it never expects you to go read the Silmarillion or some shit just because it didn't feel like explaining something. Chimera Squad just didn't really fucking feel like it. It didn't feel like explaining that five-year gap of time. It could have, but it didn't. Why? I don't know. But now I get to explain it to you. So here are the giant assumptions that Chimera Squad makes that it expects you, as probably a previous XCOM player, to simply buy without question. Assumption number one. Humanity largely forgave the aliens during those five years after the war. More hugs, Will. You owe me! Oh, okay. This has to be the case, because otherwise they wouldn't have had enough people who would willingly live next to aliens and hybrids in City 31. It has to be the case, because otherwise there wouldn't be enough people on Earth who would be motivated and willing to actually defend aliens and hybrids in City 31 from internal and external threats. Who are the people defending this city again, by the way? Oh, right. The people who for the first two games were hanging alien and hybrid heads as trophies on their walls. You remember that secretive fourth rebel group I was talking about? They're called Shrike, and they're made up of ex-resistance and XCOM soldiers. I don't think Shrike would be a small rebel group. I think Shrike would be like 90% of the XCOM forces, which then brings into question, forget internal threats to City 31, how is the place still standing? Most of these guys are the types that'd be like, I'm from what used to be the United States, and I say Kill them all! I mean, for fuck's sake, in the XCOM 2 trailers, they literally end with the tagline, Join us or become them. Regardless of whether it's rational or not, do you think this sentiment would have stuck around maybe, like, a little longer than five years? But the assumption remains. Humanity has to have forgiven the aliens to some significant degree. But I can assure you that this is all because of one very rational reason. The aliens in high hybrids were all mind-controlled to do it. They were just following orders, you see. That excuse usually works really well. But I want to throw the apologists a bone here, okay? I think there's an argument to be made that someone who is mind-controlled would not be as fully responsible as somebody else would for their actions, and that they deserve a lesser punishment or no punishment at all. But 
Counterpoint! Emotional humans, especially in a state of chaos, do not give a fuck about that! You've probably met a human before, you might even be one yourself. So you should know what I mean when I say that humans, generally speaking, are very emotional, irrational creatures that are prone to forming mobs. Now I want you to imagine that a mob the size of Earth has just caught wind that humanity is so bad! and that the aliens and hybrids that were patrolling our streets and enslaving us and conquering us, who invaded us and maintained puppet governments for 20 years, turning everyone we care about, our friends and family, into alien soylent, are now coming to us and saying, We're sorry. We didn't mean to do it. The elders told us to do it. We were just mind control. They're just following orders. With what humanity went through, and knowing how tribal we are and emotional we are, I'm not saying that the aliens should all be slaughtered. I'm not saying it's the right thing to do. What I'm saying is that it would definitely happen. I mean, talk about suspension of disbelief, right? We go from that in five years to a city where we can cohabitate. I just, I'm sorry, I call bullshit. And this is where some people come in and say, you can accept aliens and psionics, but not this. You can accept dragons and wizards, but not a 1990 Honda Accord. Yes, that is the way it is. I'm sorry that you don't get it. All of the best fantasy and sci-fi ever made relies on a foundation of at least believable human psychology. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it has to resonate with what we know about humans in real life. Motivations, relationships, actions, and dialogue that make sense to us as people. We had a somewhat believable premise with XCOM 1 and 2 in the sense that, yeah, how else are you gonna unite all these people on Earth who normally hate each other? Give them a common enemy because they've been invaded by fuck Fucking aliens! And I'm just saying, I don't know many people who are willing to forgive and forget their grandma getting turned into green dog food in just five years. But no, it's just assumed. Everyone is fine with it. You want to know the really funny thing? Even Shrike is fine with it. You would think if anyone would be prejudiced against aliens and hybrids, it would be the guys who used to kill them full time as a job. But no, even they employ aliens in their ranks. Why? I guess they just forgave them too. Why not? I might be a mass murderer and anti-democracy, but I'm not xenophobic, you bigot. The civilians are fine with it. Everyone in XCOM is fine with it. Even the ex-XCOM guys who were hanging the heads of aliens on their walls. It's just assumed that they all forgave the aliens. Everyone is just fine with it? I call bullshit! Also, of all of the non-humans in City 31, these ones are okay and these ones are not. Why? No, really, why? If we're saying that some of them are capable and some of them aren't, what is it based on? Is it based on intelligence? Is it based on how dangerous they could be when living near other things? Obviously a berserker would be dangerous, which is why they're only represented as enemies. But why is a sectoid any less dangerous? If you had a sectoid for a neighbor and you were playing your music a little louder than they would like, they can put their hand to their temple and blow up your penis from the other room. But they're relatively humanoid looking and they can wear a t-shirt, so I guess it's fine. The Andromedons hypothetically have a sanctuary somewhere in the city. I found dialogue about it, but you only ever see them as enemies. All I'm saying is, if Chimera Squad had fucking balls, if they had cojones, they would be putting an Andromedon in a t-shirt, okay? How about the faceless? There's one image of a faceless on a poster as a construction worker, but in the game you only ever see them as enemies. Give me a faceless wearing blue jeans. How about the chrysalids? They're pretty much the same amount of rabid animal that a viper is, but a viper gets to wear clothes and have a job and go to the office and the chrysalid doesn't. Why can't a chrysalid talk? A viper probably shouldn't be able to speak English with the kind of mouth that they have. Who's to say that they have the same kind of voice box or enough human DNA where they could even make it work? If a sectoid can pull off on blowing someone's penis up from the other room, why can't a chrysalid resist the urge to eat us? Just sort of seems like they wanted to have their cake and eat it too. We wanted to play with our cool alien units, but also we need aliens that are still pretty much exclusively enemies, so uh, we'll just kill those ones without remorse, don't worry about it. I'd like to never think about this game ever again after putting this video out, so here are some final thoughts to wrap up this autismo rant. 
Chimera Squad could have been really interesting. I do not think that this game was doomed to fail from the start just because it was trying to do this story. I think they failed on the execution. The characters and how they're used are a huge part of this problem. You have pre-built characters that the player can no longer customize, but the characters also don't have any sort of arc. They have no real conflict with one another despite the fact that some of them may have been trying to kill each other five years ago. And you're telling telling me that they're just gonna millennial quip at each other for the whole game? They're just as chummy at the start as they are at the end? Not a chance, man. I don't buy it. Give us some character development. Tell us what happened in between XCOM 2 and Chimera Squad as well. The game starts you out in a museum for the tutorial. What better place to do that? The way it is right now in Chimera Squad is that the museum is just full of reused assets from XCOM 1 and 2, and it tells you the premise of XCOM 1 and 2. Which, sure, for people who are new to the series, you can say aliens invaded and we fought them back. What the audience needs to know is how the hell we got here. And if you're gonna explain that, a museum is the perfect place to do it. Those are just a couple of the things I would like to see changed, but they're never gonna go back to this project. So the only thing I can really hope for as an XCOM fan is that if they make another XCOM game, if they make XCOM 3, which I hope that they do, they could just retcon everything, but I Ideally, I'd like to see them take this premise and do something interesting with it, to fix it, to utilize it in the future. To try to explain Chimera Squad better than it ever bothered explaining itself. Where's my snake? Where's my snake? Wants to speak with us. Thanks for getting the mayor killed. Also, you're fine. Ha 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 ha. Terminal is quirky. She makes jokes. You weren't supposed to hit back. It, they didn't hit back. What do you mean? You weren't supposed to hit back. You, they didn't. They didn't hit back. Why do you keep saying that? Mission is complete. It's. Oh, wait, that's supposed to be bad. Oh, no. Sorry. So she gets vaporized the same day as Chimera Squad to our city? You hear that voice in your head? That's me telling you to wake up! These rebels don't like aliens. They're trying to kill us all. Trying to turn all the aliens gay. 